Hi folks, welcome back. This is uh, the second half of the Consumer Neuroscience Lecture. Uh, my name is Joe Devlin and I am um, giving up on the trying to get FaceTime in there and we'll just try to do the lecture um, via the slide deck, hopefully try to make it as interesting as possible that way. Hopefully with GZM we'll be able to figure out a way to do something interactive uh, on the day as well. So in the first half I kind of introduced um, some of the appeal of uh, consumer neuroscience, why people were interested, gave a few examples of, of good, uh, good practice. In this part, I want to talk about it in a little bit more practical terms, and I'm going to focus primarily on sort of the neuromarketing aspects of things, that is using consumer neuroscience to, um, to create advertising, marketing, public relations campaigns, etc. Um, this, um, this is an image of uh, Martin Lindstrom, who's a brand guru and uh, again was one of the early adopters of neuromarketing. I'll give you an example of um, one, of his, uh, one of his case studies in, in just a second. But as I said, um, I'm just going to talk about um, both good and bad examples in this section and um, what, as well as try to create a framework for understanding you know, how, how you'd use neuroscience um, to, to produce novel insights, which is what we talked about before, versus using neuroscience to produce novel marketing opportunities. And I've, I've given you a hint of that already, but um, I'll go into it in a little bit greater depth this time. Okay, so I would like to start with uh, a study that Martin Lindstrom did. And um, what was fascinating was when iPhones were released and people were spending an inordinate amount of time with their iPhones, there was a debate about why. Like, what was it that was so compelling about these that people were just ignoring everything else around them. Um, and one of the hypotheses at the time was that people were getting addicted to their iPhones. What's fascinating about this is that we know something about the neuroscience of addiction, right? That is to say that different types of addiction in, uh, impact on a part of the re brain's reward system called the ventral striatum which is what's shown here in this image. So for instance, um, the red, blue, and the green are all areas of the ventral striatum that, res that become abnormal in addiction to cocaine, alcohol, and nicotine, for instance. So there was a very, very clear hypothesis that is that people who were spending so much time with their, their no lovely new iPhones had become addicted to their iPhones. And if that's the case, then we should be able to see that kind of a biosignature in a brain scanner. And that's what uh, Lindstrom did. He got together with a, a neuroscientist named Gemma Calvert, and they did this experiment in, um, uh, with iPhone users, where they had people lying in the MRI scanner, that big, great, big tube that we talked about before, and they were seeing pictures of iPhones, as well as other types of materials, as well as listening to sort of characteristic ringtones and things like that. And the hypothesis was that they would see activation in the brain related to this ventral striatum, the, the brain's reward system. In fact, that's not what they found at all. What they found was that these iPhone-related activations were really prominently uh, characterized in the insula, which is an area here, um, so in, in yellow, right? So it's, it's definitely not the uh, ventral striatum. It's significantly further away. And they were finding it... Um, to their surprise. And they said, okay, well, this is, this is really interesting because it means that these people aren't addicted to their iPhone. They love their iPhone, literally. Um, so that is to say that they looked at the activation in the insula and said, this clearly is an addiction. This is a biomarker for love. Now, what they've done is something that we in the field call reverse inference. That is to say, they've taken an activation pattern and tried to infer what was happening in the person's mind um, from that. So they're trying to figure out their cognitive state. In this case, their cognitive state is they're in love. Now, the problem with this is that there really isn't a lookup table in the brain. You can't sort of say, oh, I have activation in area X. What does that mean? What is somebody thinking in that case? That's this question of reverse inference, and it's a tricky thing to do. In fact, um, at the time, rather than publish the work in a journal, what they did was they published it in an op-ed piece in the New York Times. One week later, it was followed up by a letter from 88 prominent uh, 
neuroscientists from around the world, led by um, a guy named Russ Poldrack, who wrote an article called New York Times Op-Ed plus fMRI equals complete crap, um, which is to say that they, this neuroscience community, were not that impressed with this particular study. And the reason for that is when you start to look at the insula and try to figure out what it does, um, two things come to mind first. One is very, very few studies have ever associated love with insula activation. There are one or two, but it seems a very strange inference to go the other direction because it would mean you'd be unaware of the vast majority of the literature. In fact, what, they, what you do find is that something like a third of all um, um, fMRI studies show activation in the insula which is an enormous number. I mean, we're talking about tens of thousands of studies that have found this, um, and that it's much more strongly associated with things like hatred and disgust, pain perception, interceptive awareness, that is, awareness of your sort of internal body states. Sometimes it's associated with speech production, although that may be related to internal awareness, and body ownership. In other words, the evidence that this activation in the insula indicates that people are in love with their iPhones is just nonsense. It's, it's not evidence at any level. And in fact, the problem here is that they've tried to do something that is not doable. They're trying to do mind reading. They want to sort of look at the brain activation and say, when I see this pattern of activation, this is what someone's thinking. And the reality is that in the most general sense, this kind of mind reading is still outside the purview of what we can do in neuroscience. Now, we, we can talk about more specific exceptions to that, but that is a good general rule. Anybody who claims that they're doing mind reading in one form or another with their neuromarketing work is almost certainly trying to sell you something. They are moving well beyond what we can actually do with the data. So, if that's not the way you want to do things, and, you know, bear in mind, that if Apple had been using this information to create a, a marketing campaign, you know, a large uh, you love your iPhone marketing campaign would have fallen completely flat because people don't love their iPhones. That isn't what is going on, right? The data are not supportive of that. And you would just end up with a befused consumer base who were think, thinking, gee, I wonder what Apple smoke in these days. So it would be a big waste of money had they done that. So what about doing things well? Okay, how about doing uh, consumer neuroscience where you can get insights based on things like fMRI and use them in a sort of meaningful way? Well, there was a great study by um, Burns and Moore in 2012 where they looked at the emergence of new types of music, new like bands and, and things like that. Um, and what they did was they got a set of volunteers and gave them sort of a, a little bit of a, a quiz on the types of music they liked. And then, st then for each person, they gave them music from the categories that they actually liked. So they didn't really give people things they hated listening to. But these were all new music. They were things that were just coming out that really hadn't made any uh, appreciable dent on the market at this point. And they pay played snippets of these songs for people while they had them in the MRI scan. Um, and they did two things. One, they measured their brain activity, which was what they were most interested in. But then they also asked them. Do you like this? And if you do or don't like this, can you tell me how popular you think that this piece of music will get to um, when, it, when it has time to make it into the charts? And what they found was that people were surprisingly um, bad at predicting what was going to become popular. Um, they were really at chance. They didn't, they didn't get any of the, the most popular ones right, um, and they got some of the least popular ones right, <laughs> wrong too. Um, um, but what was fascinating was if you measured the activity in their ventral striatum, that is to say part of the, their brain's reward system, uh, as well as in their medial prefrontal cortex, which again is also part of the reward system and showed up in the last lecture as the bit that was showing um, greater activation for the, the more you liked the, the colas that you were drinking, um, then that was actually a really good predictor of music performance on the charts over the next three years. So it took them waiting for three years until they had enough market performance data about how these different pieces did for them to be able to link the brain scan data to the market performance. But what they found was the thing that was an actually a good predictor was activity in the brain's reward system. 
What was not a good predictor was people predicting what would be popular and what would not, nor was how much they liked the songs. That was not a particularly good predictor of, of how well the songs would do on the market. So what's cool about this is that this is in some ways kind of a, a neuro focus group, right? They only tested 40, 50 people, but based on the activity of the brains in those 40, 50 people, they were then able to predict market performance um, of these pieces of music in the United States. And that becomes really interesting, right? Particularly if it turns out to be something that other groups can replicate in perhaps different circumstances. So let's enter Emily Falk. Emily Falk did this great study also in 2012 um, where she was trying to predict what would help people quit smoking. So there was an advertising campaign that was about to be rolled out that was essentially saying, look, um, how do we help people who are heavy smokers, two pack a day smokers, quit smoking? And there were three different um, ideas about the best way to do it, right? One was a sort of a themed campaign around the idea that smoking kills. It's, a, it's very bad for you um, and that it'll shorten your life and you shouldn't smoke. It's really a bad idea. The second was a sort of theme campaign around a similar idea, but it wasn't that it killed so much that is that it causes disease. You know, pictures of blackened lungs and all the internal things that go wrong when you smoke. And then the third campaign was really around um, the, the problems of secondhand smoke. It's not just that you're smoking, but of course your family in terms of your, your spouse and or partner, as well as any children, etc., they all have to smoke your cigarettes too. Um, and there was a debate about which one would be the right campaign because it would, which one would be most effective. But what Emily Falk did was she said, well, let's run all three campaigns in three different markets and measure how effective each of them is. But before we do that, let's bring in a focus group of people into the scanner who will view the advertisements from these three different themed campaigns. And we can measure their brain activity. Um, to see which ones are most likely to be effective. Now, again, they're only bringing in heavy smokers, and the whole point of the campaign is try to convince you to dial into this anti-smoking number to get help, okay? And they did just that. And what they found was that um, for the, the people who got brought in, the, the, the neurofocus group in this case, they started out by just asking people and said, well, which campaign do you think would be most effective? And what you can see here is that they thought that the, the, the campaign about the diseased um, lungs and things like that, the blackened lungs, would be the most effective, followed by the smoking kills, finally with the um, secondhand smoke issue being the least effective. And that was just simply by asking people. What was fascinating was, in contrast, when you look at this medial prefrontal cortex, this, again, this part of the brain's reward system that we've seen a couple times now, there was actually the largest amount of activation there associated with the secondhand smoke issue, right? That is to say, people responded most strongly to that, at least in terms of their brain activation. And then what they found was they then ran all three campaigns in three different cities on the west coast of the U.S. If I remember correctly, I think it was in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and, and Las Vegas. Um, but because they were distributed in, in space, they actually had different call-in numbers in each location. So they could measure the amount of phone calls people made to these self-help lines, and they used that as their dependent measure of where what was most effective. And you can see the increase in call volume was greatest for the secondhand smoke campaign, exactly as predicted from the brain activation, and as not predicted by what people sat down and said would be most effective. So once again, this is a really beautiful example of using the brain imaging data, the neuroscience, to measure what's happening in the brain and predict market level performance of what's going on based on things like the brain's reward system um, in a way that was not possible by just simply asking people. This type of uh, insight is precisely the kind of potential that consumer neuroscience offers and what makes it really, really exciting. Now, I mentioned bef um, before that, you know, MRI is um, it's not a very mobile kind of thing. I mean, it requires the scanner, which weighs like 10 tons, and it, you end up lying in a tube, and it's a very sort of an unnatural environment. 
In addition, it's wildly expensive. So typically, in London, for instance, using an MRI scanner typically costs around 500 pounds an hour. Um, as a result, people are interested in some of the other methods, and one of those is EEG. In fact, EEG is, is probably the most commonly used neuromarketing brain measure. And uh, this is just a lovely video from Porsche that I'd like to share with you that we can discuss in a second. This is the human brain. By monitoring its activity, we aim to find out if the visceral experience of flying in a fighter jet could ever be matched by a Porsche. Our volunteer test subject is Jeroen. I'm quite excited, but I'm getting a little bit nervous. Our pilot is Jörg Fieber. We are starting easy 2G turn then we have about four Gs. Then we do a very, very steep turn, and then we have six or even more. So will I pass out, or...? If I go a touch further, you will. Your room will be fitted with an EEG monitor to measure his brain activity. The data will be analyzed by Dr. Robert van der Linden. Basically, we're going to measure how stimulated your room's brain is. We're going to look at an area of the brain that releases a hormone called dopamine. Now, for the first time, we see lots of activity in the visual and prefrontal cortex. We see the nucleus accumbens light up due to the release of a huge amount of dopamine. It's really, I, I, can hardly, I can hardly describe, you should try it yourself. Now that we know the effects of the fighter jets on the brain, it's time to find out. Can driving a Porsche compare? <laughs> Very similar to the takeoff in the jet. Let's look at the results. This is Jeroen's brain activity in the Porsche, and here is his brain activity collected in the fighter jet. As we can see, the dopamine levels are higher in the jet. However, overall there are clear similarities. For example, in both images, we can see the excitement centers lighting up. Based on the results, taking a hard left in a Porsche is actually comparable to taking a hard left in a fighter jet. Okay, so this kind of, um, well, we don't want to, yeah, sorry. This kind of um, advertisement is probably the most obvious kind of neuromarketing that you can get. I mean, the idea here was that they were going to release this video and hopefully it would it would go viral. People would think it was very cool and, you know, it would it reflect well on, on Porsche. Um, in practice, it, it didn't really go viral. Nobody, it, nobody really caught on to it that much. Uh, until uh, a neuroscientist, um, a neuroscientist who goes by the name Neurobolix uh, on Twitter, um, found it and and wrote a, a really scathing blog post uh, about this particular advertisement. And the reason that the that Neurobolix was a little bit offended by this was um, because to anybody with a, a neuroscience ex background, it was evident that Porsche had completely made up. Uh, all of this. This is entirely fake. So all of this is fraudulent. 
Um, so that is to say that when you put an EEG cap on, <clears throat> and you can see the red cap that uh, Jeroen was wearing, um, then one of the things you have to be really careful about is, um, is motion, like head motion, but also facial muscle motion. So, and the reason for that is that the electrical brain signals that it's recording um, are re relatively subtle, whereas muscular activity is, um, is quite a bit larger. And as a result, it can, excuse me, it can swamp the uh, brainwave activity. So first of all, you can't then put a helmet on somebody because it's just knocking the sensors crazy. Second of all, you could see from his face when he was in the, the, uh, the jet, but then also in the car, He's smiling and screaming and shouting and gurning and doing all sorts of things, all of which make those data completely useless. At a more fundamental level, they're talking about measuring dopamine release. Well, dopamine is one of the important brain chemicals that's used in reward, but EEG doesn't measure dopamine release. It measures electrical activity, and it's not something that you can localize to particular brain regions very well. So the idea that you could measure dopamine release with EEG is just simply wrong. Like, in, even in theory, that's not possible. So, um, so you know, when you, with all of that and the way that the data are actually presented and shown, it's, it's evident to anybody with a sort of a neuro background that this was falsified data. And this had really sort of pissed off neurobolics. Unfortunately, the fact that he or she took the time to then uh, attack it Made that it meant that it did go viral to some extent for for some people, but not the way Porsche wanted. It went it went viral because it was evidence that Porsche was simply providing false data to try to make a narrative about how cool their vehicles are. And let's just think about that for a minute, because at the very minimum, what they're doing, the message they're sending out is very anti-brand, right? Porsche's brand is a high-performance car with excellent engineering that delivers on, you know, all of those scientific and engineering aspects. And yet, what they're willing to do is say that, and we fake our data. Unfortunately, this happened at roughly the same time that Volkswagen got faking, caught faking their emission data. And all of a sudden, there was a bit of a narrative about these German uh, engineering and how the automotive industry in Germany appears to be uh, at odds with the truth. Um, so the, to the extent that it did go viral, um, it went viral in a very negative publicity kind of way, uh, giving out a very anti-brand kind of message. Normally, however, this isn't the way EEG is used, right? Um, so I don't want to see it again. What actually happens is EEG is typically used in, in normal neuromarketing settings for sort of copy testing. That is, taking your advertisement or your idea of an advertisement and getting it uh, assessed empirically to see whether or not it um, um, it's going to be effective or not. So this is a still ad from Dettel um, about <laughs> the effectiveness of soap. I've always thought that this ad was particularly funny, um, which is probably says more about me than anything else. Um, but what can happen is if you take this to any sort of standard neuromarketing company that offers EEG, typically what they'll do is they'll test your ad and they'll give you the kind of responses that you have here on the right. Now, I've made these numbers up because I'm not a neuromarketing company and I don't know what their actual figures are, but this is the kind of thing that you would get. You get a score for emotion, for memory, and for attention. And you just basically get a loading on the three. So people use their EG to measure the emotional level, the me how memorable it is, and how much attention people are paying. And then based on that information, and typically a database of how similar ads or your competitors' ads have done on those three scores, you can decide whether your ad fits the bill that you wanted. You wanted something attention-grabbing and very emotional? Fantastic. This might not wait so well on, on memory, but maybe you don't care because that wasn't really what your goal was in this particular instance. This is the typical way that neuromarketing companies offer services, um, particularly around copy testing. And again, it's worth pointing out that this is a form of mind reading. They're essentially saying we can measure in your mind your emotional levels, your memory levels, and your attention, and we can put a number on it. And that 83 is different than an 87 or a 62. Um, so we can do it very, very precisely and in a meaningful way. Let's think about how these things actually come about, right? So... This is what an EEG data set looks like. These are only 19 channels of typically somewhere between 32 and 128 channels. 
and each channel is measuring up and down a little electrical activity wiggles, right? That's what you can see here. In order to evaluate how they get emotion, memory, and attention, um, first of all, they'll tell you first that that's secret. They're never going to tell you where that comes from because this is proprietary. Um, and to my mind, that's already a problem because what they're suggesting is that they can do something that science can't, but they don't have to tell you how. Now, in science, we wouldn't get away with that, right? If you wanted to make a claim like we could do something that no one else could, you'd actually have to show us the truth of that. So claiming a proprietary algorithm is not something that fills anyone with a great deal of um, faith, I would say. Now, there are exceptions to that. If you're Google and you're doing you know, search, and you're going to say, look, the secret is in our algorithm. That's how we do things. Well, that's all well and good because you, the user, can see right away whether or not you're getting the results that you want, okay? That, that makes sense. If you're not getting the, the search item, items you want, then you're not going to continue to use Google. Well, look, in this case, you don't get that. You're going to get some measure of whether your ad is effective or not that you're going to then make decisions on, but you have no way of validating that in any independent way. So proprietary algorithms are another sort of warning sign to pay attention to when companies are offering their own methods. So given that, um, what we can do is try to recreate what they're doing based on what little information they share. And for instance, one of the things that happens when people are measuring emotion with EEG typically is they divide the, the sensors from the left part of the head from the right part. And the reason for this is that everybody knows that the right hemisphere is the emotional part of the brain and the left isn't. So if you could compare right to left, then you can compare the strength of the emotion traits. Now, obviously, from those of you who have heard the first lecture, you already know that that's a myth uh, that this is even based on. But nonetheless, this is the approach that's being used. They then throw out all of the sensors that aren't on the frontal lobes, that is, to the parts of the brain in the front of your head. Um, and then with the sensors that are left, they sort of average those signals and then subtract them. And the subtraction gives you a measure in terms of intensity. You can take an average of that time series over and scale it between 0 and 100 and say, ah, we've got an, an emotional score of 83%, right? Now, look, I've already highlighted that there are at least two major problems with that. There's a, there's a third, which I didn't go into in terms of the technical ways that EEG measures signal, but um, it's based on proprietary algorithm and it's based on a brain myth to begin with. So either way, what you're measuring is not emotion, right? It's not nothing, but we have no idea what it is, and it could well be something that's absolutely meaningless. Most things that you can measure have no particular meaning. So if you do the same kind of thing, but instead you replace the frontal lobe electrodes with the parietal electrodes, then you can arguably measure attention. And then if you do the same thing with uh, temporal lobe election, er, electrodes, then you can also measure memory. It's a very crude and very inaccurate way of doing this, right? It's predicated on the idea that we can read your mind from your EEG, which we cannot. So what about using EEG in a really good way? Um, so I gave you an example earlier in terms of the uh, predicting the, the uh, swing voters in the, in the Brexit election. Um, but there's another one that's, that's a particularly good example that I like that comes from the world of product development. So as many of you know, um, English is an important language to learn in Japan because it's such an important business language. But one of the things that's interesting is that Japan doesn't have this RL sound distinction that we have in English. So they don't distinguish between R and L, um, which makes it very difficult for people in Japan learning English to hear that difference between R and L. So for instance, the difference between the word light and right which is probably obvious to all of you, is exactly the kind of thing that's very challenging to somebody who grew up speaking Japanese and is learning English as a foreign language. It turns out there are an awful lot of word pairs like light and right in English that are just differ in terms of that first letter, and some of them are easier to hear than others. Okay, So what this group in Japan did that was really, really clever was they got the whole set of LR combination words, um, and then they, create, they did an EEG experiment with a set of participants where they measured the people's brain response to something called a mismatch negativity. Okay, So again, this is going back to those waveforms, which are the actual data that you get out of FM, uh, EEG. Excuse me. 
And what they find is that if you start playing a sequence like light, 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 right, light, you no doubt heard that I changed the word the third time I did it, right? I went from light to right. And what happened was your brain had gotten used to hearing light, light, light. So as soon as it heard right, that was a mismatch in what you were hearing. And as a result, you got this increase of activity called uh, mismatch negativity. That is to say there's a, an increase in negative uh, activation in your brain because of this mismatch. In contrast, when you just kept hearing light, 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 your brain was doing something a little bit uh, simpler, and that's the dotted line. This difference is a measure of how clear it is that there was a difference between the mismatch and the actual item. So for light, 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 right, light, when you hear a difference there, you get this mismatch. And what's fascinating is you don't have to be consciously aware of that difference. If your brain registered a difference, even if you weren't consciously aware of it, you still get this mismatch negativity which means that by doing this really boring experiments that people were just listening to these strings of words one after another, um, they could measure the size of this mismatch negativity, and the larger it is, the easier it is to tell those words apart. The smaller it is, the harder it is to tell those words apart. And based on the size of that EEG signal, they could rank order the word pairs so that when you start teaching people, you give them the easy ones, the ones that are easiest to recognize. As they become a little bit more advanced, you give them the more advanced words. And then as they become expert, you give them the hardest set of words. So that you give them the easiest problem to solve first, and then you make the problem harder and harder as you go along. What's really, really clever about this is that by ranking those words using this EEG signal, they got a, a, an unbiased measure of how to go from easy to most difficult, right? And it's something that's very tricky. You can't get that from just asking people because they're very, very poor at being able to tell what's easy and what's difficult. Um, so this was a, a really brilliant example, and they built, um, they built some educational tools around this as well as an app. And this kind of approach was used to make sure that the stimuli that were used in these sort of teaching English as a foreign language were optimized for the learning stage of the participants. This is a, a beautiful example of how to use EEG to help with something like product development. So again, it isn't really about you know, marketing in this case, but it is about understanding your consumers and trying to tailor your product to best fit your consumers' needs. I want to go into uh, another example. So I'm going to just play a short video for you here that, um, that you will recognize will have some issues, but let's discuss them once we're done. Neuroinsight, which is a marketing company who uses brain imaging. Actually, we're very interested in doing a study which didn't rely on spoken responses to assess the impact of outdoor media. They knew that this media tends to have quite a strong um, wow impact, quite a strong emotional impression. But it's the thing, if you ask people about those things, um, you often don't get a response that tells you the whole story, because um, all our speech capabilities are our left brain, um, and that's how we respond to questions, by using left brain responses. But a lot of our emotional response is actually comes from the right brain. So if we ask people about emotional responses, what they tell us is filtered through the left brain in order to put into words, that tends to put a rational spin on it. If I look at the brains, we get the emotional side of the picture as well. We had um, a sample of 115 people. We drove them around looking at um, a number of poster sites in West London. And then we brought them back into a um, research centre where we fitted them with headsets to monitor electrical response in their brain. And we were picking up how their brains responded as they watched a film of their poster journey. Uh, to identify what parts of the brain were active and therefore what sort of functions were going on, what sort of um, emotions they were experiencing, what the online campaign was. It tells us that um, outdoors is very effective. It stands out very well in the environment which people see. And that particularly um, the things that seem to make particularly successful outdoors are not just the size and scale of a, a structure in which people see um, outdoor advertising, but also um, how long they're exposed to it, whether it's digital or static, whether it's moving or, or static, and um, whether it's, it's on a location which in itself has a certain iconic value, where it's structure which has a wow factor. And essentially, the, the most um, powerful messages are communicated via big iconic structures, which have a particular impact on the right brain and 
I think these studies have a real importance in, in building our understanding of how people respond to communication. Um, we can have lots of theories and hypotheses about the way that um, advertising and communication works, but quite often it's difficult to validate that, certainly in a quantified way, um, because what people say isn't always what they actually do. And when we look at brain response, we're getting a very uncluttered uh, response to what people are seeing and how they're, how they're reacting to it. Um, it gives us a much better understanding, not just of what's happening, but why it's happening in terms of why our brains are responding as they do. And that builds the general understanding we have about how communication works. Okay, so Ocean Outdoor is a, an advertising company that does B2B, right? So they basically sell you billboard space or, or, or the equivalent um, so that you can advertise your products in the right way to the right customers. And Ocean got in contact with NeuroInsight, as you can see from Heather Andrews there, and um, they did a study about what makes their stuff most effective, right? And they did this using EEG. You could see the participant wearing an EEG cap. Um, now, there's no doubt that you almost certainly caught the fact that she started talking about the fact that we know the left brain is your language brain and your right brain is your emotion brain. And once again, we're stuck in that sort of, oh, we're going to do science based on brain myths kind of approach. One of the big warning signs. Look, And one of the things that you'll find and that I highly recommend that you look into is that companies who offer these services very frequently don't have anyone in the group who's really... Um, got a very strong neuroscience background. So for instance, NeuroInsight here in the UK is a, is a relatively small branch of a, of a larger international company. But when I last looked, um, which I admit is a little bit ago, but there wasn't a single person in the entire UK office who had any neuroscience background. Heather, who was CEO at the time, um, has a marketing background from, from Oxford and is a very bright woman and very articulate. And I've had the pleasure of meeting her too. Um, she's moved on, but now the current uh, CEO is again uh, another lovely person I've met with, but who who really comes from a, a marketing background. So if you don't have people who are involved in the work with a neuro background, it's very likely that you won't get things exactly right because it's a very complicated field and it requires very specialist uh, expertise. What I would say is that there's nothing. Um, it's not just neuroscientists, though. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? Because I am a neuroscientist. What I would say is that it's neuroscientists in collaboration with marketing people who are the ones who produce the best results. These are the people who understand what the marketing campaigns are, how they're rolled out, how you measure their effectiveness. And that's coupled with somebody who understands, you know, experimental design and neuroscience measures and what you can infer out of them. The best of the, the consumer neuroscience work comes when those two groups are combined and working together. When they're not, when you're looking at companies who perhaps don't offer a great deal in the way of expertise in neuroscience, then that's one of the things to, to see as a warning sign that you need to look out for. Okay, so in any event, with this um, neuroinsight situation, what were the key points that Heather raised, right? I mean, she basically said outdoor did very well, but they did particularly well when the um, when the the billboards that you're looking at were large relative to small, when they were moving relative to still, uh, when you spent more time in front of them relative to less, and if it was in a really interesting place. So the billboards on Piccadilly Circus do better than the ones on the bus stop behind my house. Now, I think that reasonable people might question whether or not there are any really novel insights in that. I mean, nothing that she said sounds crazy, but by the same token, I'm not sure I needed to test 115 people with fancy brain scanning equipment to realize that, you know, bigger things that are moving and that are in cool places do better than other, other things, right? I mean, it's just, it just seems self-evident. And then the question that raises then is, um, what, what's, the good, what's the goodness? But what's interesting is the goodness is what's in this video, right? This was a big event that was run at the Gherkin, um, and a lot of the clients that Ocean, Ocean uses were at this event, their CEOs and CFOs and things like that, and they were well impressed with this. They see Ocean as being thought leaders who are being innovative and who are using science to leverage the best in the field so that they're providing the best for their clients. And in fact, their business went up, right? So despite the fact that it didn't produce novel insights, 
it was a very, very effective way of using neuroscience as marketing. That is to say, as part of the B2B campaigning that they were doing. And it was effective, so effective that some of um, Ocean's uh, competitors came to, came to me, in fact, and said, good Lord, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? And how do we get in on it? Um, so it was, a, it was a really effective campaign. And you can see that based on the fact that it's still up on Ocean's website under uh, Research and Neuroscience. And you can see this video and others there. So what's going on with that? This is what's typically known as the seductive allure of neuroscience, right? So that is to say that just simply including what would otherwise be unnecessary neuroscience information makes something sort of more appealing, more believable, and perhaps more memorable. So there's some really good psychology about this, right? Um, um, so this is an uh, experiment that was done in the States a few years ago where, um, where they were giving people... Um, paragraphs, um, basic stories, and they included different types of extra information in it. So for instance, in this particular example, they told people that watching television and completing arithmetic problems both lead to activation in the temporal lobes of your brain, and therefore watching television can improve your math skills. Now that's a strange and specious argument, right? Um, even if it's true that both TV and arithmetic problems activate your temporal lobe, that doesn't mean that one's going to help the other. It just means that there's something that they have in common, right? And what they did was they um, they gave people this text, and they either included this uh, bar plot image here on on the left, showing you know activation in the temporal lobes, or they included this completely superfluous picture of uh, two brains with activation in the temporal lobes here on the right. And what they found was that afterwards, people were more willing to believe that watching television somehow improves your math skills when it was accompanied by this picture of brains here on the right. Um, and in fact, people even remembered the argument better afterwards. What was fascinating was this wasn't just your average punter, which where the effect was seen, but even in people who were doing like undergraduate degrees in psychology and neuroscience were susceptible to this effect. When they tested people who were academics, experts in the field, um, the effect goes the other way. The academics actually find that un unnecessary pictures of brain that make an argument silly made them angrier, and they, they, they were less likely to believe it than they would otherwise. But for the vast majority of the population, there's, this is a very strong effect, and it's what's become called the seductive allure of neuroscience. In some ways, this is kind of like a celebrity endorsement from your brain right? If your brain says it's true, surely it's true. And we're going to buy that because after the decade of the brain, everybody thinks brains are really good science. So there are good and bad ways of using this. Um, and the ocean example is a really interesting one because of course we don't know what they paid for. Like did ocean pay for insight, but got excellent marketing? Or did they just simply pay for using the neuroscience as a way to create an excellent marketing campaign? The difference here is probably one of scale. Like if you're trying to get insight, then collecting enough data to demonstrate that in a convincing, plausible, valid way that you could bank on is a whole lot more work than simply demonstrating something that we already know to be true. If you're just doing a demonstration, you can normally do it a lot faster, a lot more cheaply, um, and as a result, you can do it for significantly less budget. So let me just give you uh, a case study of, of using um, neuroscience as marketing. And this is, again, one that, one that we ran where we got approached by Encore Tickets in the West End and said, we're going to run this advertising campaign around Best Live, right? That is to say, it's always best to go see stuff live. And we know that that's true, and we're not really worried that people will stop going to the theater, but we are interested to know why. I mean, why is it that someone's willing to plonk down 60 pounds for a theater ticket as opposed to, for instance, 16 pounds for a cinema ticket versus 16 pounds a month or whatever it is to keep Netflix going at home? Um, what is it about that experience from a psychological perspective? And is there any way that we can illustrate it um, in a live setting? So we said, this is a really good question. We wrote them a sort of an insight report talking about the nature of audience and how audience changes perception and memory and emotional experience and, um, and why that is. And we then said, 
you know, this is the kind of thing that we could easily demonstrate for you. So in conjunction with the Savoy Theater uh, in London, um, they, they said, well, let's do that. And that is, you know, let's give us a demonstration of why it's worth going out when you could stay home, sitting at home in your torn up jeans with your multiple devices and not have to deal with having to pay five pounds for a, a tiny little pot of ice cream at the intermission. So normally what happens with theater, right, is it relies on reviews. You know, it's five stars, it was absolutely brilliant, etc. And in fact, you know, this is, this is literally what you see all the time around the West End. Um, and the question was, is it possible to measure this in any more concrete way that doesn't require, require just this sort of spoken word, doesn't require the sort of focus group approach? So the question that they began with, which was a very good question, is, is there anything special about seeing a performance live? And if so, how do we tell? What we decided to do was to use biometrics again. So you may recall that this uh, watch type thing here is this E4 biometric sensor. And um, we had participants in the audience wearing these so that we could measure their physiological response to the performance of Dreamgirls in the Savoy Theater. As I said, we had people in the audience. There's about a thousand people in the audience. Only about a, uh, two dozen of them, I think, are, are wearing um, sensors over, over two nights. Um, and, but nonetheless, they're part of this much larger live audience with an exciting, if you, if you like, um, you know, musical performance. It's certainly one that was, that was very, very popular. Um, and what we found was that if you look at these two lines, this is the, the performance going along the bottom of the screen time from the beginning of the show to the end. And then the, this, is, um, this is the heart rate shown here going up and down. And there are two lines here. There's a, a red line and a blue-green line. The red line is what happened when people were watching Dreamgirls in the theater. And you can see that they're, despite the fact they're sitting down, they're not doing anything physical, their heart rate is going up and down with the different narrative of the show. Um, and in fact, if you have them, a different group of people watching the, the movie version, which is very, very true to the theater version, then you can see that the heart rates kind of go up and down at roughly about the same point, but they're much smaller effects, right? There's lower, uh, so there are higher highs and lower lows in the theater than there are in the movie. Uh, and, it, and in particular, as you come into the, the, the intermission, which is uh, roughly speaking this area here, and then, of course, the end of the show, when people are really excited with the big number, there are fantastic heart rate variability that's seen there. As I said before, this is, this is actually an, uh, an indication of, of something that's known as um, emotional amplification in live audiences, right? That is to say, you know, that energy that you get from being in a live situation, um, part of that is that you actually, it changes your physiological responses. Your heart rate's faster, it goes, it goes higher and lower, and you're feeding off that sort of energy of the crowd, and we can measure that through these sort of biometric sensors at the risk. So despite the fact that the show is essentially the same, the engagement with the show is very different when you're in a live environment, and this is just a simple demonstration of that. Um, one sort of unexpected consequence of this is we, um, when we plotted out people's uh, heart rates, um, we, we separated into what the British Heart Foundation refers to as the healthy cardio zone, right? So that is to say when you're at 40 to 80% of your, your personal max heart rate, um, and we've just sort of aligned that in this particular image, but what we found was that on average our participants were spending 28 minutes of their two hour and a half hours in the theater in this healthy cardio zone. So it's definitely not the same as saying that they're exercising, but their heart is getting a light uh, cardio workout simply through the emotional highs and lows of the show, despite the fact they're sitting on their butts. So their muscles aren't benefiting, their lungs aren't benefiting, etc. There's, But there is a cardiovascular benefit to sitting there enjoying this show that equates to about 30 minutes of a light workout. Now, um, this got a lot of media attention, which is exactly what they wanted, right? They wanted to use the neuroscience to promote the material. So this is neuroscience as marketing, and in this case, particularly in the in the PR kind of realm. So we, you know, various theater groups um, had articles about this. Um, there was a, a famous playwright in the U.S. who, when he was accepting his speech 
had a big article in the New York Times where he uh, started talking about our work and said, this is why he's a playwright. This is why he writes live shows, because that energy that he gets from bringing a, a live audience into a performance and taking them on a journey was what makes his job a worthwhile job. Um, and, you know, we got this got some attention um, in um, in professional uh, trade magazines. Um, of course, it wouldn't wouldn't be anything legit unless the sun got its chance to sort of say that um, Dream Girls is as good as your heart for as a 30 minute workout. Um, I remember distinctly having this conversation with this particular um, this particular reporter. I was on a train <laughs> coming into London, and I was trying to make the point that it's not the same as an exercise workout. Um, it, because of the fact that your body and lungs and things aren't benefiting too, it's really just your heart. But nonetheless, that distinction was was a bit lost in this particular headline. Possibly the the press that I was uh, most pleased about was when Margaret Atwood tweeted about um, tweeted, tweeted about the work that we had done. And this is uh, again something that was really exciting for us as as Margaret Atwood fans. But the fact that she's listening, you know, listening to this kind of material and and seeing that the, what makes it really exciting is the fact that this science is telling us something that we already know, right? It's just a demonstration, but nonetheless, it captures people's imagination, and that was wonderful. So from Encore's perspective, this is an example of using neuroscience as marketing to sort of promote the kind of uh, story that you'd like to tell about your particular industry or you know product in this case. So to just recap there, there's a difference between using neuroscience for marketing and using neuroscience as marketing. From my perspective, using neuroscience for marketing is when you're producing... Um, oh, I've, I've reversed these. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, for marketing is when you're producing insight. So I have these exactly backwards, and I, my apologies. Um, um, that is to say, um, you need to have scientifically valid results and... Uh, that which means that you need to do it correctly and you need to do it well, which takes much more resources. It's resource intensive in both time and in money to ensure that the results that you get are valid so that you can draw valid conclusions from it. In contrast, when you use neuroscience as marketing, all you're doing is producing marketing materials, right? So you're producing um, some cool visuals or some cool facts or some cool responses, uh, and you're relying on the seductive appeal of neuroscience. And in the sense that it's non-experimental, because it's a demonstration rather than producing novel insights, it tends to be much lower complexity and much lower cost, which means you can do it faster and on a much cheaper budget. Okay, so let's just sort of wind things down here. I just want to talk about um, how you tell some of the differences between uh, good consumer neuroscience and bad neuro, uh, consumer neuroscience or neuromarketing. So I'm going to refer to this as neuromarketing snake oil, right? And I've talked about some of these warning signs as we went on, but let me just re uh, reiterate them here. Anybody who's claiming to be doing mind reading, that is to say that they can just look at some measure, brain activity or heart rate or whatever it is, and tell you what you're thinking is really peddling something that's not legitimate. There is just no scientific evidence at the moment that you can do things like that. Um, and if it doesn't exist in science, there's no reason that industry has sort of worked it out and not told anybody because they had at least a Nobel Prize in there if they could have done it legitimately. The other thing to worry about is when companies really only ever offer one solution. If there's only one thing that they do and they apply it to all sorts of different problems, that's something to worry about. Now, there are companies that only offer one solution to one problem. So for instance, a company like Nielsen Consumer Neuroscience offers a particular solution, but they only really offer it for copy testing advertisements. Well, that is to say they've found a solution that they think is very good and sensible and works with copy testing, but then they wouldn't do other things. So they wouldn't, for instance, be able to have done the study that NeuroInsight did um, on Ocean Outdoor uh, because that's not a copy testing issue. So what I'm saying here is that you need to be careful of companies that are only offering one solution that they're applying to multiple different problems. That's not the way this actually works. If you're going to try to get insight, you need to solve each problem individually. The other thing that's hard to look for but is worth looking at is whether or not the company has people in it that actually have decent neuroscientific credentials. I'm sure that they have people who are technicians and I'm sure that they have people who have good marketing chops. That's excellent. And that's essential 
but that's not the whole story. They also need people with actual neuroscientific uh, backgrounds, and that probably needs to be at least postgraduate level. I should add that this is not typically medical doctors. Um, medical doctors have a little bit of neuroscience and a little bit of physiology and a little bit of pharmacology and a little bit of lots of things that allow them to do their job, but medical doctors aren't trained as neuroscientists. They're trained as medical doctors. Just as you wouldn't come to me if you had coronavirus, uh, you shouldn't go to a, a, a doctor if what you want is a neuroscientist. Any of these things that are based on neuromyths are just immediately warning signs, right? I mean, if that's the predicate, then just forget it. The results are going to be meaningless. And then finally, if what they're saying is that you could, you know, we could tell you how we did it, but we'd have to kill you, then forget about it, right? They're using these proprietary analyses that have no external validity to them and in principle aren't validatable because they won't share the information. If they were doing something that was scientifically valid, they would have to make the methods open to everybody's scrutiny. So look, what if you get this wrong, right? What if, um, what are the consequences? So, you know, getting neurobolics angry with you and possibly having some sort of little minor segment of the internet shouting at you and shaking their fist because you made up your data or you did something that they thought was invalid, that's annoying, but it's probably not a bottom line concern. It's a totally different story if what you're peddling is an anti-brand message, right? If the message that you're putting out goes exactly against the message that you'd like associating with your company, then that's something that you do genuinely need to be concerned about. And Porsche is a good example of that. Similarly, if you are nominally producing insights, and those insights are going to be something that you use to base a, like a marketing campaign along, like the fact that you love that iPhone, then you better believe you better believe that the data give you sufficient evidence to think that you do love the iPhone. If everyone's just going to look at your campaign and scratch their head and think, "Man, Apple's gone insane," then that's seven or eight figures of marketing spend that goes down the drain, and that is a very, very serious consequence. Finally, there are cases um, such as this example in the U.S., a company called Lumosity, that. Um, where they've been fined by government ombudsmen who've taken them to court and said that there is no evidence to support their claims. So Lumosity is a brain training game where they were arguing that using Lumosity could help stab off Alzheimer's, excuse me, among other things. Um, and then when they were brought to court and, and, and had that claim tested, and they said, well, what's your evidence for that? Ultimately, they didn't really have sufficient evidence for that because they didn't really understand the neuroscience very well. They were using it primarily as a marketing claim um, and ultimately had to pay a $2 million fine, 1.4 million pounds for lack of evidence. And of course, they had to pull those ads and, and, and remove them entirely. So getting the evidence wrong is important. And it's not just important to me because I'm a neuroscientist and I think that it's, you know, we should get our neuroscience right for sort of purest reasons. These have bottom line implications for companies. As a result, if you're going to use neuroscience to try to gain insight, which I think is a wonderful thing to do and it has a lot of potential, then by definition you need to make sure that you're doing it in a valid, meaningful way. And typically that involves having to collaborate with people who understand the neuroscience. Now, mind you, that's not enough. They also then need to understand your business concerns and the marketing aspects and all the rest of it so that they're capable of doing it in a, a meaningful way and not just go off and, on their own little tangents and ultimately you get nothing useful out of it. Uh, and I accept that that kind of intersection of the two groups is a small set at the moment, but the mere fact that you're here and listening today and are interested in these topics is probably an indication that overall there's a rising tide here and that there are a lot more people who will be much more savvy about this moving forward. I like to end with this slide where I just talk about the Gartner hype cycle, right? And you've probably seen this before, but the idea here is that anytime you introduce a new technological trigger, you get this kind of characteristic pattern over time. So you introduce something and very soon afterwards, basically people get overly excited about it, this peak of inflated expectations. They think that it does everything, it's the answer to all of their problems, and they gush about it in a very sort of over-the-top kind of way. But what you quickly find is that that uh, leads to this trough of disillusionment where people's expectations aren't uh, 
aren't validated. Uh, there's lots of examples where things don't do what they were supposed to, and people go from gushing to throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But what happens over time is that people become familiar with what the strengths and the weaknesses of the, this new technological tool are, and how they can be used productively and how they fit into the larger landscape. And that's this sort of slope of enlightenment. I'm hoping that today's lectures and today's session very much help work on that slope of enlightenment because now you should have a, a little bit better sense of what's available, uh, what are some of its strengths and weaknesses, and how might these be applied in various different types of business settings um, in order to uh, in, in order to reach this kind of plateau of productivity. That is, the point at which consumer neuroscience methods will supplement but not replace the kind of more traditional marketing methods like focus groups and, and implicit attitude testing and all sorts of other more traditional measures. Um, insofar as they provide novel insights that you can't get otherwise and you can leverage that information to make better decisions for your company, for your consumers, and for the public as a whole. And with that, I will say thank you very much, and hopefully this will now lead into an interactive session where we can discuss things uh, between us.